Brayden and, and Scarlett, good to see you again. Thank you very much. You too. Okay. Yeah. So what did you think about schools uniting for the day for Ukraine this week? And what more can us kids do to help? I think it's fantastic that schools have united to support people in Ukraine. And I know that you've been raising money for of a charity with uh, baking stuff and, mm -hmm. and all sorts of other things, and that's fantastic. But um, what I worry about, and, and please do more, uh, but the thing I worry about is that I think young people in this country understand how bad it is in Ukraine because uh, I think the, the media has been very good at getting the message over and, and Sky has certainly been covering it brilliantly, absolutely brilliantly. But uh, I, I think about kids, young people in other parts of the world uh, who are, might not know and whose parents might not care. And uh, I, what I would just wonder is whether there's more you can do uh, as, as, as young people to, to find those other young people, as, you know, write to them, contact them by, uh, by on social media uh, and get the messages across to other young people around the world so that they can talk to their parents about what's happening. Because there are some countries that are frankly much more apathetic mm -hmm. than the UK is about this. We care. This is, is sending us into a real, real uh, deep, deep anxiety and grief. But other countries, are, uh, I think, need to wake up. Mm -hmm. And we know that the situation is really bad in Ukraine, don't we? You know how devastating it is. Yes. But I think the sensor of attention that a lot of people want to know and many kids want to know is, is there going to be a World War Three? And another thing that I know a lot of kids are really worried about is the introduction of nuclear weapons. So w what is happening? I think it's very important for us to understand what's happening in Ukraine. This is a, uh, a, a war, uh, a, a conventional war uh, by... Vladimir Putin uh, to conquer and subjugate, to crush uh, a totally innocent country and a totally innocent civilian population who've done nothing wrong, none of them. And what he's doing is, I've never seen such a clear difference between good and evil. And I think that uh, what he wants is to get away with it. And in order to get away with it, he's going to try to sound threatening to the rest of the world about what could happen, including use of the types of weapons that you describe. But I think it's very important that, that we treat that as a complete distraction. This is about helping the people of Ukraine to protect themselves. They have every right to defend themselves, and we need to, to help them uh, with weaponry uh, that we can supply, and we need to do more, and we need to be giving them more economic a practical assistance as well, as well as sanctioning Russia, being very tough with Russia. Now, if these sanctions don't work, you know, what's the next step? They are already working. The Russian stock market hasn't been open for the duration of the, of the conflict, as far as I can uh, see. The ruble has, has fallen dramatically. Uh, you're seeing real problems for the Russian e economy. They, uh, they got inflation now. Uh, running at something like 30 percent and uh, there's a there's, there are going to be real issues for for Russia but we're going to have to do more so uh, we will tighten the sanctions and we will impose more sanctions on uh, nominated uh, individuals named individuals uh, companies uh, we have the ability to do that now thanks to the laws that we've passed and I think that will tighten the uh, tighten the, the screw, tighten the, the vice further on Putin's uh, regime. And I think that the political impact of that will be, uh, will be very tough. But I'm not going to pretend it's going to work overnight. And we've got to be ready to, to keep going for a while. So a lot of people think that President Putin is a very bad person. What did you think of him when you met him? I think that he is a guy who grew up in the, the Cold War. He's a secret service man. He's a KGB man. He's a Russian spy. That's how he thinks. Uh, he thinks in a very adversarial way towards the West. He believes that the West, countries like ours, are trying to encircle Russia and threaten Russia. And he's obsessed with that idea. And he's wrong. And I think that he was very shocked and upset 
by the way the Soviet Union collapsed in the 1990s, the early 1990s. And he thought that that was a humiliation for, for Russia. And what he's trying to do now is to, is to rebuild as much of the, the old Soviet Union as he can. And you're far too young to remember what it was like, but it was a pretty grim communist, socialist entity. And it uh, w was held together by force. And what he's trying to do is to, to build it again uh, with the use of violence, uh, starting with, uh, with Ukraine. And he's already invaded Ukraine before. He's already invaded Georgia before. That's what he wants to do. I think he, he sees himself as being the successor in a way, not just of Stalin, but of, of the Tsars. And he sees himself as a, somebody in, in the tradition of an all-powerful Russian autocrat. That, that's how he sees himself. Now, as day goes on, you know, day by day by day, more innocent people are being killed and more cities are really being destroyed and obliterated. So when is enough enough? It's already way, 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 way past enough. It's, a, it's appalling, and I don't think anybody can, can watch what's happening in Mariupol or uh, uh, Melitopol or any of the, or Kharkiv, uh, any of the cities that are being, so, or Kiev itself now, that are being so mercilessly attacked without feeling absolute agony of sympathy for the people of Ukraine. And it's a it's a, a nightmare and I don't think anybody expected to see something like this in in Europe we haven't seen anything like this in Europe really since the Second World War 80 years ago and we I think people in European governments in Western governments are struggling to understand what's happening and how to deal with it and I think we're all realizing that we're gonna have to do more we have to do more to support uh, the Ukrainians. But what we can't do is allow Putin to start framing this, to start claiming that this is a war between him and the West. It's not. It's about him trying to crush Ukraine and other people around the world thinking that that's not fair, that's not right, and thinking that we should help the Ukrainians to, to protect themselves. Now, if he does get, you know, a hold of Ukraine and he does almost conquer Ukraine, what about countries like Finland and Sweden that aren't in NATO? Aren't they at really severe risk? That's, I'm afraid, exactly what they think. And the other day I had, uh, I think it was actually Monday, uh, we had a group of, uh, of, of, of European countries, some of them NATO members, some of them not NATO members, uh, uh, some of them in the EU, some of them not in the EU, uh, but all in that area, the, it was the, the Nordic countries, uh, the, the Baltic countries, plus Holland, plus us, and uh, they, you know what I mean by the Nordic countries? Uh, can you elaborate? Let's just, let's just see if we get it. So Denmark, Sweden, Finland, Norway, Iceland, mm -hmm. Nordics, yeah. the Baltics, Lithuania, Latvia, got, got any Lithuania, Latvia? Mm -hmm. Do you know? Estonia. I don't know. Estonia, Lithuania, Latvia. Those are the three Baltic countries, mm -hmm. and then uh, we 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 also have the, the Dutch because they share they share that uh, that view. And if you talk to the uh, the Finns and the Swedes, which you, you rightly mentioned, they are really really thinking about it now. And they're thinking, because um, tra the Finns in particular, their traditional posture has been uh, of strict neutrality. Uh, they haven't been members of NATO, but I think there's a pretty big debate going on right now in, in Finland, as you can imagine. Do you not feel bad when you see innocent and order ordinary people and children getting bombed, like at the Mariupol Theatre? I, I, I do, and I think that it is, it is appalling and I think there's been nothing like it for for decades and I think every European leader every Western leader <clears throat> everybody in my position is now thinking you know what more can we do and 
it is it is heartbreaking um and we have to do more uh by means of humanitarian assistance we have to do more uh with with military help it's appalling to see what's happening in mariupol and uh across the whole of ukraine and i think it's it's for every western leader now uh, we are facing big big moral question about how we can continue with our current strategy and whether there's more we we can and should be doing um you know if you think about it when kuwait was invaded by saddam hussein a, a huge international coalition was put together to liberate kuwait now that's not happening today because everybody knows as as, as braden was saying that russia is a nuclear power and uh, the risk of of miscalculation the risk of of escalation the, the risk of things becoming uncontrollable is very great but we've got to do more to help and uh, we all understand that and uh what i feel most is that putin should recognize that he is a he's the international court of justice has ruled that this is a a genocide uh what he's doing is is a war crime and i think if there's going to be any hope for him uh he's got to pull back immediately he's got to stop this and he's got to take his troops home why isn't the uk doing more then the uk has progressively been doing more and more and i it's not a competition but the uk began by being the first european country to to give military assistance and i i think i'm right in saying that uh, as things stand we've given the most if not one of the, one of the biggest donors of military assistance we certainly held uh biggest european donor and the americans have given a lot uh we've we've held a lot of conferences to get other countries to give money so we help those other countries to 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 source the uh the help that the the ukrainians need we were the first country to uh to say that the swift a uh, payment system had to be stopped and that's the thing by which the uh, the russians get paid for their their oil and gas that's had a that's had a big impact on the russian economy we were the first to stop uh aeroflot from from flying to put sanctions on loads of banks i think we've now sanctioned more banks and individuals about 1000 or all in uh than the the european union certainly and uh we will continue to do more so i'm not i'm not saying this to um you know say the uk is doing more than anybody else or or to be uh, to 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 brag about what the uk is doing but just to say that there's a huge amount that we're we're already doing we're the biggest donor of humanitarian aid mm-hmm. to the region and uh we will continue to do uh, as much as we possibly can and i think we'll do that because we know that that's what the british people want and i think that's the overwhelming feeling of uh, of of people i talk to now i think we have as the uk we have a good understanding of what is going on in ukraine but president putin and the russian government has been telling uh, i'm sure you know many russian people and many russian kids false you know fake news and not actually telling them what is going on in ukraine and what's going on in their neighboring country so as the uk how can we make sure that the kids in the uk only hear the truth and know what is the truth in the uk or in russia in the uk I think it's very important that kids in the UK should have access to the best possible information about what's going on and I I think that Sky has been covering it very fairly and, and very well. I think that you know the BBC has done a great job too uh, and I uh, I think that you should try and share as much of the, of that uh you know good valuable authenticated material as as you can and I think that uh kids now they're very good at using all the you know uh, the social media that uh that exists to 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 get that that stuff around i i think that what we need to do is work with other countries to help kids in russia understand what's going on because they don't exactly and we know as we've said the russian government and putin has blocked all international social media platforms and foreign channels and any tv or radio stations that have tried to report the truth so it's it's a very it's going to be difficult to get that message across you know into russia really isn't it it is difficult but on the other hand we well, we've got lots of uh uh well, we've got uh, lots of groups who are working on how to get the information through we're going back to some of the of the 
techniques that were used during the Cold War to tell people inside the, you know, in in the communist world, in in uh, in the in the old Soviet Union, what was going on. Uh, there was a thing called Radio Free Europe that that we used. You know, you you can't block uh, radio. Uh, stations, you, there are, and actually, it's very difficult to stop people really accessing the internet if they uh, if they want to. Do you feel bad that the UK hasn't taken in more refugees when you know some places like Poland and neighbouring countries have taken in close to two million? They have, but of course, the the, and the UK doesn't have a, a a border, so we haven't been, received the first wave. But we are taking many, many more now as they as people decide to come on to. To the UK, and that's right. You know, we've got an amazing record as a country for taking people in. And the, you know, I, I, I said in the in the Commons, the House of Commons, the the government is composed of people, many people who are the children of, uh, or, or grandchildren or, or descendants of of refugees. And we understand the importance of it and the the benefit that um, uh, refugees get, but also the benefit that the country gets from 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 taking people in. And uh, I think already we've got, we've got two schemes that are up and running, two big schemes. One's for family reunion, so any Ukrainian here, uh, who already here, can, can bring in quite a, a wide range of, of relatives, quite distant relatives can, can come in. And I think uh, about 6,100 have already come in under, under that scheme. And then we've got a plan which was announced uh, a few days ago so that if you if you if you want to welcome um, uh, a Ukrainian family or Ukrainian refugees into your in, into your own home or evacuees into your own home, then the government will support you. And I think 150,000 British families or, or, or uh, householders have, have come forward uh, to say they, they'll, they'll do that. So so we're seeing we're seeing massive generosity already by the by the British people. Well, I know that the schemes are, you know, really great and they're going to be really helpful, but I know that the visa application process is really, really complicated. So how are you going to make it easier? I think we've tried, I, I know, I, well, I think we've tried to simplify it a lot. Yeah. And so you can now do it online and do it, and, I, and I'm told, because I kept asking about this, uh, I'm told that it's now much more efficient and you get, you get the right answer, you can get the application through online very, very quickly. Um, I think that some people, you know, some people have said, well, you should get rid of checks altogether, and you should just let people in without any 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 checks. I just don't think that is practical because, at the moment, if you look at what's happening in Ukraine, it is a nightmare. You've got lots of people wandering around, very heavily armed. You've got a lot of people who aren't necessarily who they say they are, and um, you know, we uh, we've had some cases of, of false papers already. Now there may be very good reasons why the people. Is, Saying they're someone different from from who they are, uh, but I think we just need to be uh, to be a little bit careful. And uh, you know, some some fast checks I do think are, are sensible, but I think getting rid of checks altogether is not a good idea. Well, following on for that, will you be housing any refugees here? Well, I I am not the uh, I'm I'm a mere I'm a mere uh, tenant. Of this, uh, I'm not even a tenant. I'm a, I don't, I don't know what my status is exactly. I'm, I'm the, the temporary occupant of this, uh, of, of, of this place. Um, it is up to, uh, to, to others to decide how that would work. But if it, if it were to be possible within the, uh, the, 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 you know, there are a lot of security yeah. stuff. Well, that, of course, that, that, and you um, can see it outside when you come in. That, uh, that, that they have to do. But uh, if it were possible, if there were room. Uh, then, because one of the things people complain about number ten is it's already it's already quite it's already quite quite packed. But if we could if we could if we could do it, then I'm sure uh, people would welcome it. I'm sure that I'm sure there are a lot of people here who would who would want to do it. It's a very very big building. It is. It is. Now, since you've been the prime minister, you've had a lot of you know big big situations to deal with, haven't you? You've had Brexit, you've had COVID. I know you was seriously ill with that yourself, and now you've got this going on. How does that make you feel? I mean, you've had a lot of big, big situations again to deal with. Look, I think that the most important thing is always to remember the people who put us, put me here, and they put us here to do particular things. And so in spite of all of it, we've just got to get on and deliver it. And the thing I've got to do is deliver the whole levelling up agenda. I think I talked about that last time. Mm -hmm. uh, and what I mean by that is 
doing a lot of stuff to help people to make the most of their lives, wherever they're born, wherever they grow up, we believe that people have genius and talent and enthusiasm and energy all over the country. But we think that opportunity is not fairly distributed. And we want everybody to have the opportunities they need. And so with better infrastructure, things like better broadband, better skills, better technology, we want to see opportunity spread around the whole of the country. And, and that's what we're going to do. From all these things happening, have you not had enough of being the Prime Minister or having this job? Well, you know, I think that I'm aware that there are some people who uh, think that, uh, you know, that, that um, some members of the opposition uh, who would uh, like to remove me from office, but that's their job. Uh, my job is to my job is to is to continue, and I think that um, you know the the great thing about about democratic politics is that we have a we have a system whereby the people can remove you, and that's what they don't have in Russia, mm. and it's what they have in Ukraine. In Ukraine, the people could vote out the president and the Prime Minister and the government. Mm -hmm. In Russia, if you stand against Vladimir Putin, you're probably going to be shot or poisoned. Mm -hmm. That's the difference. That's why Ukraine matters. Well, I think that is a, a very, very good point there. We, we've touched on it over quite a few shows of people that have tried to report the truth, and it really it's a bit unfortunate because it hasn't really gone well for them. So what do you think about, you know, the situation for them over there who are standing against it? And do you think that there are people over in there Russia, who, in yeah, in Russia that's, that, that stand against it? Um, but obviously it's too scared to say it really because it is a massive deterrent. I think it's, I think it's tragic. Uh, but it's in a, it's in a, a the, the result is that Russia is in a, in a negative feedback loop, if you know what I mean. It's in a downward spiral because um, the, the, the more repressive it is, the more the talented people want to, to leave. And the more the talented people leave, the, the worse the economy, uh, the greater the repression and the sadder the situation. And that's, that's what's going on. I find it so upsetting because, I mean, Russian citizens, citizens who are meant to be following President Putin don't want this themselves. So they don't, and I think it's very important that we should... But one of the things I think that, you know, you, you could do is just reach out to young Russians and say, you know, is this really being done in your name? Is this what you want? Because I bet they don't. If they, if they knew and they understood what was happening... Mm -hmm. I bet they wouldn't support it. Yeah, and that's why it's upsetting that there's so much fake news because they get told the wrong thing and then they believe the wrong things. Well, I just think you need to, to find ways of getting the truth through to them, and we and, and that's a that's what we're we're all working on on that as well, and and using all sorts of ways to overcome the the barriers. Mm -hmm. But you saw that thing the other night when that uh, newscaster. Do you see that thing? She suddenly popped up. Yes, we did. Yes, yes, we did. Yeah. yeah. So you know, the, the the truth is starting to creep out. Mm -hmm. And I think the more people do that, the more overwhelming it might get for the Russian government. Well, you know, I think uh, I think it's very, I think it's very important that we don't um, we should keep our focus very much on on Ukraine and. I think if Putin gets the feeling that the world is all trying to uh, to change the Russian government, uh, which we're not, that's not what this is about. This is about protecting the people of Ukraine. But if it, it's important that, that, that he wants us to start talking about that, because then he can say, oh, they're all against me, they're all against Russia. This is about trying to stop what the International Court of Justice has already called a genocide in, in, in Europe. And it's a really sad situation, but as you say, I think we all just need to keep on trying our best and do our best. You know, we do. Do what we can. Yes, and uh, look, uh, do you know, I think that um, Vladimir Putin is... Let me try and uh, offer you this sort of reassuring or, it, or at least consoling thought in a, what is a terrible, terrible time. I think Putin fatally misunderstood what Ukraine was. He totally underestimated the Ukrainian people and their desire to 
to fight on, uh, fight for their country. Uh, he got it so badly wrong that I think he's already failed. And the question is, how do we now help support the Ukrainians through this terrible time? Because in the end, they are going to succeed and he's going to fail. Well, oh, go on, sorry. Because um, Russia is so much bigger and... I mean, President Putin thought that Ukraine was just going to completely give up. He did. But they've stayed determined and they've kept fighting, so... That's, that's exactly, exactly right. Mm -hmm. And I think that it was obvious within the first week that he just got it wrong. And he was living in a, in a, in a, a fantasy world about what Ukraine was. And he'd, he'd made the mistake of, living in, of, of believing his own propaganda. Yeah. And in fact, he's a, he, he is a... He's a fantastic advertisement for the importance of having a free media. Because if they had a free media in Russia, and if he had proper politicians mm -hmm. opposing him, then he wouldn't have done such a colossally stupid and, and, and dangerous thing. Well, thank you so much for talking yeah, to I us. Think, I think it's a two really, well, the whole interview had some really strong points in it, but I think that's a really good place to finish. Thank you. A bit of reassuring news. So, yeah, thank you so much for joining thank us, you. Prime Minister, and thank you for your time. And you. And thank you, Braden Scarlett. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. You.